I'm Scott Al Miller, and this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I want to talk about the common misconception that so many people believe that you only get 90 days on a tourist visa when you come to Nicaragua or most of the countries here in Central America and the region. In reality, you get quite a bit more. So we're going to talk about what exactly you get, how you get it, what that means for you. Today's episode. It is a gorgeous day here in Nicaragua under the palm trees. I'm enjoying the sun. It's warm, but it's not hot. We have a bit of a breeze. It's paradise, but it almost always is. Nicaragua is fantastic. And in a place that is so fantastic with year round beautiful weather, you're going to want to stay more than just three months or 90 days. But most people, whether they're just misinformed, reading websites that don't have the right information, or are trying to convince you that they need to sell you residency services or something of the sort, are going to tell you that you only get 90 days on a tourist visa, and then you need to do something dramatic like a border run. And of course, they often make border runs sound much more dramatic than they are. And for some countries, they can be pretty dramatic. But here in Nicaragua, our border is Costa Rica, and it is a traveler's paradise. And doing a border run into a place like Costa Rica is incredibly simple. But you still don't need to do those border runs anywhere near as often as people generally assume. So let's talk about that. If you look at nearly any online resource, it's going to tell you that Nicaragua gives you a 90-day tourist visa when you cross the border, and that's all you get to stay. This information is partially correct, but it's very misleading in how it's presented, probably because the people who post it are never actually coming to Nicaragua and are just reading websites and trying to get some clickbait. They're not actually doing the research or understanding what these things mean. So this is really important. Yes, it is true. When you cross the border, the amount of time you're going to get on your tourist visa is 90 days. But that's super semantic. That is the number of days that are assigned to you as a tourist at the moment that you cross the border. That's not the total amount you can get. It's just the amount that you get in that one specific moment. So the statement that you can get up to 90 days when you cross the border is technically true, but it doesn't mean what you think it means. And it certainly doesn't mean anything useful for any real person. Nobody actually cares about, until you're just doing some paperwork, how many days you get when crossing the border. What they actually care about is how many days you get to stay in the country before you have to do something like a border run, just leave, or maybe get residency. And that actual number is 180 days. But how does it work? So when you cross the border, yes, you get 90 days. That means three months, you really don't have to do anything. You can go into Nicaragua or anywhere in the CA4. We talked about that in other episodes, but Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras share a border zone with Nicaragua. And once you're inside with a visa from any of them, you can move around essentially transparently, but you don't reset your time by moving on to another country inside that zone. You're getting 90 days within the zone, not within an individual country and then you can move transparently around between them. It operates much like the Schengen in Europe. Here in Nicaragua, you are able to go to your local regional departmental capital. For me, that's Leon here in the, the departmental Leon. It could be Rivas in Rivas. It could be Masaya, Masaya, Granada in Granada. Most of the departmentos have the same capital name as their departmento, so this tends to be very easy. Or you can always go to the federal capital at Managua and you can ask for an extension on your tourist visa. And generally, this is very simple. It is a 30-day extension and just gives you 30 more days, and you can do this three times. So of that, your first two renewals, which gives you, you get 90 days originally, then 30, then 30. So you, you've been here up to 150 days. At that point, all of those are just renewals. You have no requirements whatsoever. If you want to go for that last 30 days to get yourself up to 180, it is generally expected. I do not know if there's a strict rule on this. I don't know what the written rule is on it, but I know that when you're in that final 30 days, it is normally expected that you are going to produce an outbound ticket in order to get to that last 30 days. 
I'm pretty sure that there are situations where you can do without that. I don't believe it is a super strict rule, but it does exist, and I do know that I've had to do that myself. So assume you will need to do that, but ask your departmento at the time that you're doing it. That is definitely the kind of rule that may change depending on the situation. It is definitely the kind of rule that can change very easily over time. So even if it's true today, it may not be true by the time you see this video. So that is the kind that, that's very fluctuating. Just check and ask what the requirement's going to be, but that is as simple as having a bus ticket or a plane ticket. The same kind of things you have to show for return from Costa Rica if you're doing that. So it's very simple to deal with, but if you don't know you have to deal with it, it could present just a little bit of unnecessary hassle. Uh, but that is that is it, and it's only that last time when you go for that very final 30 days. And so if you're trying to stay all the way to 180 days, yes, they want to be absolutely sure that you are going to leave at the end, because everything else is only a, a soft penalty if you if you overstay. But if you overstay the 180, it's a little bit of a different category of overstaying your visa. And that technically, for those who are wondering, that is what an illegal immigrant is, right? If you stay past your visa limit, you are the exact term illegal immigrant. That is overstaying a visa the world over. That is what illegal immigrant refers to. Uh, you're just one who didn't sneak over the border, presumably, but came in on one visa and overstayed to where that visa is no longer valid. You're now visaless uh, as an illegal, illegal immigrant. So that's not a status you want to be in. Now, Nicaragua is not Nicaragua is not generally super vindictive about people who do overstay. There is a day-by-day -day penalty, and it just adds up over time. So if you decide to stay a really long time, it's going to get pretty expensive. Trust me, you want to simply renew your visas and do the border runs. Those things are cheap and easy. There is no realistic reason that you would need to do anything else. And if you do have a reason, if you have a serious medical condition and you cannot do a border run, you cannot renew, you cannot get residency, send a lawyer to talk to Immigracion and work out a deal, Not to Migracion, to work out a deal. They will work with you. They don't want to put you in a tough situation, but they don't want to not follow process so they can help it give them the power to help you. Don't try to hide. Don't break the rules and then ask for forgiveness. Tell them what you need work with them, let the system help you. This is not the United States, this is not Canada. Nicaragua does want good things for you, for the country. If you're legitimately trying to stay, if you legitimately have hardship, they will actually put it in an effort to make this work for you. So give them that opportunity. Uh, if you don't tell them, what can they do? And then it's too late, You're then you're explaining why you broke rules and explaining why you didn't ask for help and didn't alert anybody, right? So that's, that's your process. But for anyone coming in under normal circumstances, 180 days. Now, special thanks to Scott Moore from YouTube on There's Got to Be Something More on his channel. He was here in Nicaragua last year. This year he is in Shela, Guatemala, and he just reported from up there. This is as I expected, but it's important to note that he just verified this, that it is the same 90 plus 90 total days of extension up in Guatemala. To the best of my knowledge, and I have not verified this, so please don't quote this, but don't be surprised if this is true. I believe all of the CA4, that's us in Guatemala, plus El Salvador and Honduras, all have a matching system for this, because we kind of need to because of the way the border zone works. Otherwise, an extension in one wouldn't correctly carry over to another, but it needs to. So I believe all of us have matching 180 days with 90 days on arrival plus 90 days of extensions, but I know the two end countries do. So that is something we have verified. And if you have not yet checked out, there's gotta be something more. He has a great channel about retiring across Latin America, a little bit like an opposite take on the same topic as generic expats. Uh, so if you have not seen Scott Moore's channel, check them out. He's up in Shayla, Guatemala right now, and uh, they're looking at getting up to monetization on YouTube. It is a really tough road to get those initial uh, viewers and subscribers and requirements to meet those YouTube uh, minimums. So if you could go up and subscribe to them and help them out, I know they would really appreciate that. And leave them a comment that you found them here from this show on the Scott Allen Miller vlog. And of course, Tell him they need to get a light because he's doing videos in the middle of the night on his balcony with no lights and it's 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 dark. Uh, <laughs> but go help them out. They would appreciate it. So uh, if you're coming here, you're going to get all this information that it's really short times that it, and it's not 180 days. And importantly, this has been the standard across the region for a really long time. Panama was like this a decade ago and probably was like it long before then. Mexico has long been like this. The CA4, which is the four countries I mentioned here that we're a part of, they 
they've been doing it a long time. I have not done my research to check on this in Belize. I have no need to be there for 180 days. So it's not something I've looked into, but I believe, I believe that they do it as well for 180 because they're part of the Commonwealth. And generally that's how they work for Americans and Europeans at least. Uh, and the one country that was 90 days in the region was Costa Rica. And the reason that suddenly everyone is talking about, oh, it's so great that there's 180 days, people should do 180 days, is because Costa Rica just upped from 90, this is about five months ago, they upped from 90 to 180 days to match the entire region with only, I believe, the US being an outlier, Canada's 184 Americans. So it's everybody in North America and Central America and Panama, technically different regions, uh, all together basically have a uniform 180 days, more or less, across the entire region. Costa Rica was the outlier. However, so many uninformed and just looking at soundbite travel guides, and I hate to call her out, but hey, Nadine turned me on to this because she posted a thing saying, where are the best places to travel for digital nomads? And she listed Costa Rica as the best in the region because of the reason that they gave you 180 days and they were the last ones to give you 180, not the first. So they're getting rewarded on all these travel sites because they caught up with the regional standard rather than leading. They're the trailer for this. And it's great that they caught up with us and we're all uniform now. 180 is probably where it should be. It makes a lot of sense. But we also need to keep in mind that they're not being good about this. They're just not being bad about it. But it is worth mentioning that here in the CA4 and in much of the region, the visas for staying here do not require a digital nomad visa. So if you do plan to be a digital nomad, you can come to the CA4 on the standard automatic tourist 180 day program. You don't have to apply for the 180 day digital nomad like you do in Costa Rica. So even now, Costa Rica's system is much more just paperwork and effort than the same thing or better up here. So Costa Rica, while they've upped the 180 days to match that number, they have not yet matched the overall smooth process that we have here for digital nomads. So it's still not as good. So even with that, hey Nadine, I'm calling you out. Their 180 days should be seen as a failure that they've rectified, not as a bonus, and their need for specialty digital nomad visas is a negative. That makes it the worst country still in the region for digital nomads. Not that it's bad. Costa Rica is a great country, definitely for consideration for digital nomads, and it's wonderful that digital nomads now have it as an option, as they basically didn't before, but it is not on par with the rest of Central America yet. The rest of Central America, maybe not Belize, I have not looked into Belize, it's a tiny market, but the CA4, the bulk of Central America, leads the region and is one of the leading places in the world for digital nomads. It is so cheap, it is so easy, it is so visa-free, it is so automatic for nearly everyone to come here and be a digital nomad. So in that context, this is the place to be when you're looking at visas and time limits and those kinds of things. Now, Costa Rica does have things like the automatic hairpin renewal, but I don't believe that applies to the digital nomads, or if it does, it's a little bit different. Here, because we use the tourist visa, everything that applies to regular tourists applies to digital nomads as well. So the, ex the very large, extensive, 180 days plus in and out border run another 180 days on and on system works for digital nomads. And when we talk about residency, which you do when you can no longer do the border run system, you have to apply for residency, become a resident. You still get to be a digital nomad under the resident system, which is normally true most places, but just important that it is not an exception here. Every process here is as smooth, as transparent, is as cheap, and as flexible as can possibly be. There is a reason why the CA4 are the world's digital nomad haven. I'm going to make a video called Digital Nomad Haven and dig into the CA4 and how awesome it is. Maybe I'll do that when I'm up in, in El Salvador coming up, uh, I hope, in April. I'm checking out Mexico, another great place for digital nomads, uh, coming up in just a few weeks. So when you're seeing online that people are talking about complications, basically assume this. If you see anything about your visa process, border run process, time limits, anything of the sort, for Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras, and it doesn't sound like the best thing you've ever heard, you can safely assume either you heard it wrong or the source you have is wrong. Really, really safely. I know of no place on earth that is more friendly and open for people to come and stay, people to come and vacation, people to come and work remotely, such as digital nomads, or people to come and retire. All four of those things, we're the best. We're the easiest, 
or the most transparent or the fastest. So if you see something, and I really mean this, if you see something, say something. If there's some country that looks like it's as good, let alone better, let me know. I want to get down to those comments. I want to hear about it. Who is even trying to compete, honestly, with this region? Um, and I know, like, Panama is pretty good, but I think the CA4 is still ahead of Panama. But Panama is right up there, right? Like, if you're going to be in this region, you got to try hard to, to keep up because it is so great here as far as the paperwork. Right. You may not like the weather. You may not like the language. You may not like the food. You may like there's a lot of things that are, you know, subjective and it's your personal opinion. But when it comes to the actual effort of the paperwork, the amount of days you get, the rights that you get, uh, basically everything is as good as can be here. And before anyone pulls out the scam websites that don't do any research, things like PricewaterhouseCooper, they are a known fraudulent accounting firm. They are not a source of legitimate information. Their site is pulled from old sources and is out of context. Their information is not technically wrong, but it is never right in the way that people use it. If you see anyone looking at or quoting PricewaterhouseCooper, just feel like, oh, these aren't people who are taking it seriously. This is a site that is used for misinformation. That is their job. No one from PwC comes down to Nicaragua and asks questions. No one comes down and does research. No one actually checks on things to see what it really is like. They look up some law on the books. They don't look to see how the other laws apply to it. And they say, oh, there's, you know, there's this law. It does this thing. Yes, that's true. However, there's this other law that says none of that applies to the situation. So why are you quoting it, right? It's because they're just they're doing the fastest, cheapest thing so they can sell views, right? Stay away from those, those things. It's not that they're attempting to mislead you. They're just not trying to inform you. That's not their job, right? PricewaterhouseCooper just recently lost a major lawsuit because their accounting was fraudulent. Their accountants weren't even real accountants, like thousands of them. Like, seriously, this is you. No one trying to be legitimate in their research or anything should ever be looking at PricewaterhouseCooper. They are not your friends. You are not their customer. I don't know who their customer is, but it's not you. Um, so stay away from that stuff. That's not how you get real information. In small countries like Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Panama, all those, you really only get real information on the ground. Things change quickly and big companies and even other countries often don't have the resources to put someone here just to keep up with potential changes in some paperwork that may only apply to a person or two, if at all. And, you know, people need to do on the ground research no matter what. So the idea that there's gonna be companies out there doing lots of research, doing surveys, trying to run businesses, digging in and finding out what the laws really are, how they actually apply in real life, doing it across a number of businesses uh, to be able to collect any kind of meaningful information, even just the legal written information and discovering whether or not that applies at all, all those things are not things that realistically companies can do. The effort to do that would be astronomic. The cost for someone like a PricewaterhouseCooper, if they intended, which I don't believe they do, to get even correct information, they would have to hire expensive American resources, send them to Nicaragua, have them live here full time. And what do you do to actually find out how things work? You actually have to buy and sell property. You actually have to start and stop businesses. You have to run through these processes and discover how it actually works that's not something companies like that are realistically going to do, and no one should expect them to, but we tend to feel like they do. Like, we have this imagined world where big companies have, like, magic resources and can just get information out of the ether. It doesn't work that way. You have to be on the ground doing research. you got to be talking to businesses. you got to be starting and stopping businesses. you got to be doing these things to gather that information. And likewise, people ask about, like, real estate information, and we'll cover this on other episodes, but there's a lot of information that people assume someone has about real estate that does not exist in the universe. Even the government often doesn't have the amount of information that people expect just individuals to have. Uh, and that can be pretty surprising, but things like this, it applies as well. So in summary, 180 days is what you get everywhere here. Your digital nomad access is beautiful and perfect, and you don't have to worry about uh, all these you know, frequent border runs. You don't have to worry about getting kicked out. You don't have to worry about long periods that are expected to be outside of the country, and you don't have to worry about getting caught doing this system. This is the official mechanism of the CA4, Nicaragua included. You are expected to get up to 180 days. You're expected to do border runs and come straight back into the country. That's not a bad thing. That is not skirting the system. That is not a loophole. That is as designed. And we have gone into in other episodes the mechanisms of that and why the government uses that, why it makes sense, why it's a very logical, affordable way for a small volume of tourists to extend their stays until they go into the residency program. 
And at the end of all this, what we end up with is entering into the residency program, which takes you into the next phase of being able to stay in Nicaragua as long as you desire. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel and the work that we do here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I'll put the link on the screen. Your donations make so much of a difference. We make essentially nothing. Unlike Scott Moore, who makes actually nothing from YouTube, we make essentially nothing. We just looked the other night. I did a live stream for four hours and they asked on the live stream something about the amount of money being made. And we looked at the past live streams and the best one had made only $2.65 for more than three hours of, of live time. So we're bringing in of time recording less than a dollar an hour uh, when we measure it. So to give you guys an idea, I know it often seems like YouTube brings in a lot of money. It does not, that's not a thing. So when you guys go to like buy me a coffee or whatever, there's all these different mechanisms. Pretty soon, soon we're gonna have merch. Those things are the only things that really pay the bills, and we really appreciate everyone who does that. It makes a huge difference. And uh, and of course, we love bringing this content out, so we're happy to do it, but it does help pay our bills for sure. And uh, as always, like, subscribe, share on social media, just post the links from the show, watch another episode, that tells the algorithm that everything's working, and I will see all of you tomorrow. <laughs>